Turn your attention to the book of Malachi once again. If you have a Bible, please go with me to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And if you're unfamiliar with the scriptures or if you're missing your Bible today, um, there's one available for you on the row somewhere. Please don't be ashamed to use that one. And if you don't have a Bible, please don't be ashamed to take that one as your own. It's our gift to you, and we're thankful that you're here. Um, this morning, we're in the last section of the book of Malachi. And again, just if you're unfamiliar with the scriptures, if, if you're towards the middle of your Bible and you encounter names at the top like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, just common names, then just go back left a little. The book of the Bible just before Matthew is Malachi, but uh, it goes by fast, so it's a short little book. This is the last prophet to close out the Old Testament. Um, this is the last words of the Lord before the New Testament opens that would be 400 years later after uh, Malachi is written. And this morning, God deals with the last of these disputations that he has with his people. Um, and we read about it starting in chapter 3, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. And unfortunately, the, the thing that is being contended or contested in this chapter is not limited just to these people back then. Um, it is very much still a common thread for our time. The question is raised about God's justice or his fairness. Listen to the word of the Lord from Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 13. And I'm going to ignore the chapter break. I'm going to keep reading into chapter 4. So if you think, what's he doing? Like, that's on purpose. Listen. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall leap like calves from the stall. And you shall tread upon the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that in the next few minutes as we look into it together, that you would work. That your Holy Spirit would take these words, and some of them precious and long remembered in our minds, Lord, and now as we consider them in their context, would you help us? Would you help us to glean from this text the truths that will help us to hold on to Christ Jesus and walk by faith until that glorious and great and awesome day, your day, comes. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this message, The Difference the Day Makes. 
The phrase is actually a difference a day can make. But when the scriptures speak of the day, even titled in some of our passages, the great day of the Lord, it speaks about a theme that is woven from the beginning to the end of scripture, the great day of the Lord. I don't know when your birthday is. I don't know if it's in the spring, summer, fall, winter, but it's the one day that you have some leverage in your household to say, no, I would rather do this. After all, it is my day. You may not get all that you push for or ask for, and at some of our ages, all we're asking for is peace and quiet. However, this great day that is spoken of through Scripture is the Lord's Day, not Sunday necessarily, but this great and awesome day of the Lord where his name is vindicated and all will see him for who he is and what he is doing. He brings, I've been studying First and Second Thessalonians in preparation for what's coming next. In Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul talks about the return of the Lord as bringing relief to his people relief to his saints, to those who've longed for his appearing. This day that is coming is a day of relief. For those who have not trusted in Christ Jesus, who persist in rebellion, the day will bring, as described here, heat and judgment. And I think one of the hardest parts about what's being put before us in this passage is the passage longs for God's people to put their hope in this day, not in our day of death, when we are reunited with the Lord, that is a day of hope, but it is not our ultimate hope. This day doesn't look forward mainly or even only towards our relief, it looks forward to the Lord's glorification where his name is exalted, a name that has been dragged through the mud is exalted on that day. That's the great difference between our Christian hope as believers, thankfully, of being reunited with the Lord in heaven and the day of His return. And all through Scripture, the thing we're supposed to be looking forward to is not only reunited with Him, but His return, the day of His return. So this text opens, this text concludes with this glorious and great day. And we'll, if we get far into it, we'll, we'll get some, but we'll look into it more later uh, next week. For this week, though, I want to back up with what brings all of this about, what brings up this topic of the great day of the Lord. And it's this dispute that happens in chapter 3, verse 13. So just knowing that some of you prefer an outline, just kind of see how the text is broken down. There are three paragraphs, the one in 13, the one that starts in verse 16, and the one that starts in chapter 4, verse 1. And so I found an outline I just want to put before you. And Shane, I'm going to let you just kind of do that. Um, this uh, outline here talks about the, the charge, the dispute back and forth, and starting in verse 16. And then this book of remembrance that's being put before us, sorry, that's verse 13, and then the book of remembrance in verse 16, and then the day of the Lord, how all of this applies to their lives, the day of the Lord starting in chapter 4, verse 1. So let's begin just looking at the charge there in chapter 3, verse 16, the charge that's put before them. Here once again, the word of the Lord, starting in verse 13, God says through the prophet Malachi, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord puts forward His, His, His word. I, I, I hear what you all are saying. And the things that you say to one another or whisper in your own heart, let me put them into the light of day. Let me put words that are fair and a fair representation of what you think. Let me put it out there in the open for us to deal with. And he says, your thoughts, your words have been hard against me. And of course, they shoot back at the end of verse 13. But you say, how have we spoken against you? So again, as we've been saying week after week, this is not 
representing an actual conversation between the Lord and His people. But as He listens to them, as He watches over their lives, as He hears their, their thoughts uh, and their conversations, He understands the deepest recesses of their way of thinking and feeling. He understands their thoughts and intentions Clearly, and he brings it up and out to deal with. And he says, your words have been hard against me. And when they push back, and not in confession, when they push back and say, prove it. How have we been hard against you? He responds by saying, you have said, verse 14, it is vain to serve God. Now, there's an there's a unfairness that's being brought to the surface in this text. And not only an unfairness that's here, like, so they, their complaint is serving God brings us nothing. Nothing good. Serving God isn't worth life in this time. The complaint is, serving God is in vain. Now, if we just go back to the text for just a minute, they continue and ask about profit. Like, what good is it to keep on serving God? Or, as verse 14 continues, what profit is in, in keeping the charge of God or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So this whole concept of listening to what God requires in Scripture just thinking back to their time before the cross, looking back to the Old Testament, looking back to the Moses on Mount Sinai and the things set up in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and this way of life that God calls them to live. And they say, what is the prophet? What good is it? As a matter of fact, it goes even further to talk about like what, instead of more than just like what is good or what's the profit of keeping God's ways or walking as in mourning before him, verse 15 goes even further. Verse 15 says, not only do we not see any benefit of walking with the Lord, any benefit of walking in His ways. Verse 15 talks about their determination of heart and mind that now, verse 15, now we call the arrogant blessed. In other words, from now on, we have firmly fixed this way of thinking. Our hearts are firmly fixed hard against the Lord, and we look around and see that arrogant and wicked people are blessed, and they don't encounter the punishments that God has said He would bring. And so we call the arrogant blessed. That's it. We run over verses like verse 15. That's a terrifying verse. Like to be so much of the state of mind where we understand and see from our limited perspective that good people, people who walk with God, are treated this way, and the arrogant are wicked, advance, and they get the blessings, and we are firmly fixed in the concept that walking with God is useless. And even scarier when he talks about not only evil do is prosper, but this, this last phrase, they put God to the test and they escape. I'm reminded of the Lord Jesus when he was 40 days and nights in the wilderness without food and this enemy tempts him to turn stone into bread and he talks about it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The Lord Jesus so treasured His relationship to God as not only Son, but now as coming as servant, that He would not put God to the test. And here in this verse in Malachi 3, he, the, God's people are saying that the people around them, the evildoers around them, not only prosper, but God lets them escape. They put God to the test and they escape. 
There's no skin off their back. There's no problem. There's no punishment for them. And so there's a firmly fixed within the mindset of the people of God that serving God is not worth it. The arrogant, the evildoers, and the God testers prosper, are blessed, and escape unscathed. And so God says, I have heard your hard words against me. And to some degree, we can understand this. It is natural to feel like when, quote, bad things happen to good people, that that's not fair. And when you put that in the realm of believers, because that's the real rub of this text. The real rub of this text is that it's not the people of God looking at all the unbelieving world. This is the people of God looking at each other and saying about each other. Did you see what he said? Did did you see how he tested the Lord? Did you see his arrogance or her evil? Where is God? It's when those who claim to be believers act this way and seem to get away with it. And the, the response or the temptation is not only a hardening of heart and mind, but a hardening of words. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. Which means at least this. God is listening to our words. God is listening to the way we speak in the privacy of our homes, in the privacy of our own thoughts. God is listening to how we talk to one another. God is listening. And woe to us when we prematurely judge the Almighty. Woe to us when we count God's slowness to wrath and long-suffering patience as God just doesn't care. Woe to us if we are so, when we are tempted to be so short-sighted that we don't understand or appreciate the totality of who God is, both love, patience, mercy, and coming justice. So they've concluded that serving God isn't worth it. And the charge that God brings them here is one of short-sightedness. And I think one of the things that's just woven through the passage that I've read is not only is God listening to the conversations that his people have, but he continues to listen. Notice in verse 16, there's, there's a change that happens, and this has never happened before in the book of Malachi. Usually, at this point, we expect a little pushback from the people. So, I hear this, you say that, how can we say this, how do you say that, and God brings out evidence and they push back and there's a conversation back and forth. This is a one time that doesn't happen. Malachi breaks with this sitting, this courtroom kind of dialogue or a parent sitting on the edge of the bed of his teenager. God breaks with this dialogue back and forth. Malachi breaks with it and he talks to talk about a story, a narrative. Here's what happens. And one of the things that is, is amazing about this next section in verse 16, is not only does God continue to listen, but however long this has been happening, these six disputes, this is now the sixth time we've had this back and forth between God and His people. Some of God's people wake up. Some of God's people, without any word of rebuke, just realize Wait, we have been historically wrong about God over and over 
and over. This is six times this is happening. And instead of pushing back on God again, they, they wake up. They humble themselves. Notice verse 16. It starts with the word then in some of your translations. It's a great transitionary word because it just shows that after that initial pushback and thinking and speaking of God as being un- unjust and unfair, some people repent and return. Verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Now, great things are going to be spoken of them in just a minute. I just want you for just a minute to hear what you hear or see what you see in verse 16. God is still paying attention to what's being said. And those who fear the Lord, those who rightly revere His name, those who love Him, have not just repented of their harsh thoughts about God's ways, they've not just done it in their own minds or in the privacy of their own relationship to the Lord, they've talking to each other. Then those who fear the Lord spoke with each other. If I'm going to use my mouth to slander God's timing and justice, then when my mind changes and I come back to my senses, I'm going to use my mouth to talk about His goodness and the fear of Him before one another. So, so there's a, there's, if I'm going to complain publicly or in front of my friends, then I'm going to exalt the Lord publicly or in front of my friends. And I think that this change of mind didn't just happen on their own. I do think it comes as a result of this interacting with one another. And if I'm right about that, that means that when we share our complaints with one another, it is a precious moment. Someone is being vulnerable, someone's being transparent, and they're sharing that this is, this is just the way I'm thinking. And this is a precious opportunity to either exacerbate the wound, I totally know what you're talking about, God's not fair. Or to come alongside and say, let us patiently wait on the Lord together. What will we do with those precious moments when we confide in one another? Will we be be like complaining kids who just make problems worse? Will we help move towards a resolution and a healing and a remembrance of who God is and His ways. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, and again, the Lord is paying attention and to what He has heard. And, notice the, the passive tense here, a book of remembrance was written before Him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed His name. It's as if God commands one of His angels to to start writing. A book of remembrance, maybe listing them or their conversation. And notice the, the, these two qualities that mark these people. Yes, they've been tempted by what seems to be God's slow justice. But the, but the deeper thing in their heart and mind is, is not... Hardness against the Lord, it is a fear of Him and an esteeming of His name. A fear of Him, a due reverence. I heard one pastor say that fear of the Lord is like the thing that you warm your hands by, the fire that you warm your hands by. 
It's what you keep going back to over and over for, for comfort, for safety, for warmth. The fear of the Lord is the thing that you treasure. So this, this fear of the Lord is not just afraid, it is a deep and abiding reverence. And that, that, that connects with esteem His name. That, can be a, that too can be an odd concept in our time. Does it mean to, what does it mean to esteem the name of the Lord? When I was in college, the farce movie The Princess Bride was in vogue. Now, I, I'm not making a movie recommendation. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And in this movie, there's a Spanish swordsman, Anigo Montoya, and he is on a vendetta mission to kill the Dread Pirate Roberts. If you've seen the movie, I'm sorry. And he, the vendetta that the Spanish swordsman is on is because apparently this Dread Pirate Roberts has killed his father. And this vendetta consumes the Spanish swordsman. All he talks about is avenging his father. Hello, my name is Aniga Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. Like, you can tell I've seen that movie way too many times. There's this one scene where the pirate is climbing up a cliff and the Spanish guy is standing on top. And he says, hurry up and get to the top because I want to sword fight you and kill you in honorable battle. And the guy climbing the top of the, the cliff is just like, I'm getting there, give me a minute. And the Spanish guy says, I'll throw you a rope and help you up to the top. And the pirate says, you're wanting to kill me. I'm going to know that I can trust you to pull me up to the top. And he says, I swear to you, on the name of my father, you will not die. I will bring you to the top. And the pirate says, throw me the rope. In other words, esteem for the Spanish, for the Spaniard's father's name has absolutely consumed him so that when he says to the pirate, I swear to you on my father's name that you will make it to the top, that word can be trusted. In our day, it is common in our culture to esteem nobody that way. We don't hold anyone in esteem, anyone's name that way. But when the name of the Lord so consumes his people, I promise you, in the name of my God, this, that, or the other. Can that be trusted? Fear of the Lord and those who esteem his name, it's, it's two sides of describing the same coin or the same person. And when God sees a heart and mind wholly devoted to the honoring of his name, do you remember what he told the priest back in chapter 2? My word to you, priests, is that you take my glory to heart. Stop just giving me lip service or Sunday service. Take my glory to heart. God says, look, looks now in this passage and says, among my people, there are those who are hardening their hearts as what they perceive as a prolonged injustice. And there are those who are turning away from that hardness of heart and returning to the fear of the Lord and the esteeming of his name. And God makes this wonderful promise over them, verse 17. They shall be mine. Now, it is really important for you to understand that we're not talking about two different people Two different sets of people at the outset. That little word then in verse 16 says or indicates that the mass of God's people were hardening their heart against him. Looking at how unfair life seems to be. And then there was a change of mind for some. And then God says, those who have that change of mind, who fear my name, who fear the Lord and esteem my name, I will make them 
mind. And what's really weird about this passage is that throughout the Old Testament, the distinction has been Israel is mine and all the other nations are not. Here in this passage, the distinction is not between Israel and non-Israel. Here in this passage, the distinction is among those who are called my people Israel, I will make some of them my very own. In other words, some will persist in this confirmed stance of saying, from now on we regard the arrogant blessed, and some will change their mind and come back to the fear and, and the fear of the Lord and the esteeming of his name. The Lord says in verse 17, they shall be mine. The book of remembrance is written, put their names in it. They shall be mine. What a thing to belong to God, to be truly His. And notice verse 17 continues, in that day, notice now now we're talking about a great and final day. In that day, when I make up my treasured possession, they will be mine. And I will spare them as a man spares a son who serves him. And then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Now, now, now lest, lest we think we, we understand what those two groups are, the good people and the bad people, notice how The Hebrew explains righteous and wicked between the one who serves God and the one who does not. The righteous and the wicked are further characterized as the one who serves God and the one who does not. And there's a distinction. And the thing that's going to make that distinction clear is the coming day. And there's coming this day that will help make this distinction even among God's People, those who are Israelites, there's going to be a distinction among those who serve God and those who don't. Notice it's even called like between like a son who serves. God will spare them as a man spares a son who serves him. Do you remember throughout the book of Malachi, there was this service of God, this, this worship that was happening. But it was all done in vain. It was all done with stubbornness. And it was all done with um, lackadaisicalness. In other words, they didn't care of the quality of their offerings before the Lord. They didn't care of their quality of their service before Him. Even the priests who served the Lord did so in vain. Did so as just giving lip service. So this, the kind of serving that's being talked about here is one that starts in the heart and roots outward. This Those who fear and esteem the name of the Lord and serve Him. God says, I will make you mine, my treasured possession. And you are the one who serves me. So, this reminds me of that that slide I keep putting up in front of us to kind of keep and keep grinding it into our minds. Like we were made to know and enjoy and to show the glory and worth of God. And we say with Job and the other saints, like even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In other words, I will not let the short-sighted arrogance 
take root and hold in my heart and win the day. I will not say with the others, from now on, all the evildoers are blessed. No. We will return to the fear of the Lord and the esteeming of His name, and we will serve Him. Even when that service doesn't seem to bear fruit in blessing yet. Now, just briefly, the results of all of this are amazing. The distinction happens in verse 18, and God promises once more you will see that distinction, and then God explains, starting in chapter 4, this day that's going to come. And what's amazing about this this passage that we read before, starting in chapter one, sorry, chapter four, verse one, that it speaks of the arrival of the Lord Jesus. Now, listen, listen. Chapter four, verse one. Because behold, the day is coming. Notice how often he speaks that way. It is coming. A day burning like an oven. Like we've had some hot days this summer. A country Bible, you know, in Nebraska. This, so there's nothing like this coming day. A day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers. Now notice the charge that was laid against God earlier in chapter 3 is brought up and out. All the arrogant that are blessed and the evildoers that get away with it. God says, a day is coming and it will be burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be like stubble, like a burnt forest. The day is coming, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave neither root nor nor branch. So like, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, when Isaiah the prophet speaks of God's judgment on Israel, it's like a burning forest, and yet there is a, a stump left. Like a tree that's been chopped down, and a stump is left. And out of this stump, Israel being chopped down, out of this stump, a little shoot comes up. It's the Lord Jesus, my servant David. God is saying there's a future day coming that for all evildoers and all the arrogant, it'll be such a consuming fire that there is no chance of anything else shooting up. There's, there's no chance of that coming back again. Any more evildoers any more arrogant coming back on the scene. It is a final wiping away of the arrogant and the evil and no chance of return. No branch left and no root left. Nothing left in the ground to take up nutrients and shoot up again. Nothing left. And indeed, it has to be that way. If there's going to be a world where God's people leap like calves broke free from the stall, then there has to be a world without fear. If God is going to make His treasured possession a world for them that is full of joy, what else do you call leaping like calves from the stall? You not just call that existence, you call that joyful existence. And if, if a calf is going to go leaping from the stall with joy, there is no fear of any wolf around the hedge. But God says there's a day. He says it's my day. It's a day when all the arrogant and all evildoers 
wiped away, burned away. And by people, you ever seen kids who've been on an 18 hour car drive? You ever seen like, you can always tell the rest stop when a family's been driving for hours. Seatbelts come off, doors come open, and kids go running everywhere. Like when you've been pent up for so long and finally released and, and with the blessing of the one in charge, run free. There's nothing to fear here. God says, there's a day coming. Will you wait for it? Or will you plant your flag now in the soil of God's not fair? Will you go for the temporary blessing of throwing in your lot with those who curse God and die? Or will you wait for it? Are you short-sighted and arrogant? Or do you fear the name of the Lord and wait for it? The day is coming. Now, what's amazing about this text is verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. That's, that was quoted by John the Baptist's dad when he talked about his baby to come and the Lord Jesus who would come after him, this son of righteousness that is rising. When the sun rises, the night is done. When the sun rises and its rays go forth, it is healing. When the sun of righteousness rises, it is the opposite of injustice. And when he rises with healings in his wings, he rises for those who fear His name. That's an amazing thing because you would think that if righteousness or justice is coming, how could it come for sinners? In other words, like the arrogant and the evildoers are burnt and we have to say in all honesty that we would deserve the burning as well. But this Son is promised as something good. Son of righteousness with healing in its wings, and it's for my people, those who fear my name. Notice he no longer calls them my people necessarily. He keeps characterizing them as those who fear his name. The coming of Jesus, this Son of righteousness, this God of justice, is a good thing for those who fear his name. It is healing. And this healing in its wings, it's a weird idea, the imagery of a sun with wings. It was used of the wider Persian government that ruled over Israel at this time. And God is saying, like, all that is hoped for in these fake gods that the Persians served, I am the one that actually is able to provide. And this new day that is dawning will be a blessing to you. And it would be right for you to say, Dean, I don't understand. The the Lord Jesus has come, and we're in that day, so where is it? Like, did I miss something? It is what we in theology call the already and the not yet. That what God starts when Christ came the first time, God will bring to a completion 
when he comes again. And we're to wait for it. And yes, God will do all the burning, God will do all the judging, and to some degree it seems like his people will have some part in the final outlay of the new world. Verse 3. Ashes under their feet. God says, this is a day that is coming when I will act. Wait for it. So there's this conversation that's happening. It's complaint and a return and a promise. And it's right for you to ask, how should we respond? And I think one of the ways that we should respond is by number one, just being aware of and mindful of the common temptation to doubt God's justice. If God is good, why is this happening? That's an that's a, that's a okay common temptation. But, be, but beware of it. Let it not harden your heart. And I think passages like this one preserve for us a second takeaway, that there should be, number two, a rejoicing that God treasures the repentant. Last week, this week, the texts call us to return to God. Return to fearing Him and honoring or esteeming His name. And if, so if number one is just being aware of that that temptation when it comes upon you to doubt God's justice. And number two from this text is rejoice in this, that God treasures the repentant. So it, you may not feel treasured. Life may not change very much. Your situation may look the same. But the God of Scripture and of our salvation says, I take you as my treasured possession. You are mine, and your name is written in my book. Number three, we just set our hope on God's coming day. And again, this is just a shift in our thinking. We keep thinking... Like, I just want the pain to end, and I am not throwing any stones at that. I want the loneliness to end. I want the unfairness and injustice I'm being treated. There's, there's no stones being thrown at that at all. I only get that. Scripture says, like, this day of ultimate healing that's coming, it's a day that is also about God's ultimate public glory. So let's long for that day. A day that doesn't just mean relief from suffering for us, but it also means the global glorification of the God of history. So we set our hope on that day. And then for some of you, it means for the first time taking shelter in the Lord Jesus. The one who was promised and the one who came and the one who died and rose again so that sinners like us can rest assured that we will be the Lord's treasured possession. That our hearts and minds be transformed and open and find refuge in Him. The sixth dispute ends the book of Malachi. And it ends on a high note, a glorious vision of a bright day that is coming, a day when God's people are released into a world without fear or pride, a world treasured for his own. Would you stand and let me pray for you? So, Lord, we thank you for providing a text like this. 
that helps us refocus and take our eyes off the temporary and keep, keep them wholly fixed on you and what you're doing. And a text that teaches us to be patient with you as you've been long-suffering and patient with us, waiting for you to bring your plans to consummation. We confess, Lord, that it is easy for us to take our eyes off of you and your plans and what you're doing and what you promised and to put it on this world and all that we're missing out on. So we ask and pray that you would be our vision, that you would be our hope, that you would be the thing that sustains us through trial and temptation. And so we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. We prepared another song to lead you in. So a hymn, familiar and famous, hopefully words that will provide comfort and grace as we go our separate ways. of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now. You're dismissed in his name.